All right, record button is operating. Um, this is the Monday, 7th, December 13th, 2021 meeting of the Norton Conservation Commission. It is now uh, 632. Um, we have participating myself, uh, Julian Kadish as chair, and we have Lisa Carroza as vice chair, uh, along with commission members, Don O'Reilly, Dan Pearson, Dan Doyle, and Carrie Schneider. And uh, I'm going to announce at this time that unfortunately, Jean Blood um, has resigned from the commission due to uh, personal uh, situations. Uh, so we do have a full board tonight. And anybody listening who would be interested in um, considering applying to be a member of the commission is very welcome to do so. Uh, and you can certainly contact our director, John Thomas, for any details about the um, joys of serving on this commission. How's that, John? All right, and as our usual um, um, requirement, uh, we need to open with reading of the preamble concerning the necessity to conduct uh, this meeting by remote means. So. Uh, Dan Pearson, if you'll begin with that. Pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, GL Chapter 30A, Section 18, and the Governor's March 15, 2020 order imposing strict limitation on the number of people that may gather in one place, this meeting of the Northern Conservation Commission will be conducted via remote participation to the greatest extent possible. Specific information and general guidelines for remote participation from members of the public and or parties with a right and or requirement to attend this meeting can be found at the end of this agenda. Members of the public attending this public hearing slash meeting virtually will be allowed to make comments if they wish to do so during the portion of the hearing designated for public comment by raising their hand virtually or pressing star nine if participating by phone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. In the event that we are unable to do so, despite best efforts, we will post on the Norton Cable website, www.nortonmediacenter.org, an audio or video recording, transcript, or other comprehensive record of proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting. All right, thank you, Dan. And um, we have um, several uh, hearings not previously, not continued. There are new public hearings. Our first such public hearing is a determination and it's determination number 1117, uh, request for a determination of applicability uh, concerning four Langoon Lane for Michael and Lisa Fournier. And it concerns um, the, an application to build a set of rear entrance stairs. So do we have a representative of the applicant? Yes, uh, good evening. This is Craig Siganowski of Room Engineering. <clears throat> I'm not sure if, I'm not sure if Mike Forney is on or not. Um, as you said, yes, over. Craig, I'm here as well. Okay, so Mike Forney, the owner of the property. He's in the process of converting a single family home into a duplex. Uh, we've been before the planning board and the zoning board of appeals and have their approval to do so. <clears throat> the last step to make it illegal, a second floor illegal unit is to have a second entrance. Uh, there is an existing deck at the second floor level that at this time does not have a set of stairs. So we're looking to build a four by four uh, landing and then a set of stairs that would come down to the ground to uh, be the second entrance to the unit. <clears throat> uh, the work would be done, uh, obviously attached to the deck so there'd be a post, a couple of posts coming down from the deck to support the new uh, landing. That would have to be set on uh, footings and those can be dug by hand. So realistically the work is proposed to be 
uh, put in place by hand. The uh, carpenters come in and build a staircase. So the no, closest. Just want to inter interrupt for a second. It, it, do we have a set of plans that we can share? I mean, it's a pretty simple project, but yeah, um, I could, if you allow me to, I can share the screen. You have you have availability, Craig. Thank you. <clears throat> Does everybody see that? We can. Yes. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> so the. Uh, Resource area is a small pond that's off the back of the lot. It's the uh, rare property line. <clears throat> it's not. I, I think it's connected to the reservoir through a stream, but it's not. A, it's not part of the reservoir. It's separate from it. So, the closest point to the uh, landing post would be 66 feet. And, and this time, the entire rear yard is lawn. <clears throat> a lawn area. So the, the project appears to consist of a simple set of stairs there labeled the proposed staircase from the second floor. Correct. All right. Um, any, you're all set, Craig? Yes. So any questions from members of the commission? And if not, we can open it up to members of the audience. I'm just scanning. Uh, the participant list, I don't see any hands up. And just to review that, um, if you, uh, let's see, I think it's the reactions. If you press the reactions button, there's an option to raise your hand for question, or quite frankly, you can just unmute and, and ask your question. But as I said before, this is a simple project, very straightforward. I don't see any hands up. so. I just I have one, consider one, to clarify one thing, Julian. Yeah. I was just, uh, the erosion control, is that what's going on the outside of the, um, it's like on the perimeter of the property? Is that? No, it's the heavy dark line. It's, uh, oh, okay. All right. I see it. Yeah. And I, I mean, me personally, I would question the need for erosion control. I mean, this is a fairly, minimal grade and the the work is so um limited uh, i think that's that's it might be at the discretion of our conservation director i don't know how other people feel about that i think if you're going to undertake the is the work going to happen this winter because you'll never be able to stabilize restabilize the lawn in time well in time it's too late now um so I would recommend if you're going to do the work this winter and you won't be able to apply final seeding and stabilization until the spring to have one there through the winter. I just don't know what the timing is. No, I believe he wants, he's got all of his approvals from the other boards and also from the building uh, department. So yeah. he's looking to go as, as soon as he can. Okay. I mean, the question is, do you expect, it, it doesn't sound like you're taking any heavy equipment. Everything should, should be just on, on foot. I mean, you're not planning on, on driving any equipment back there. That's what would chew up your lawn. Correct. It should, should, be, it should just be by hand. Okay. I would, I would uh, position to just have the erosion controls in place over the winter time. It usually works to your betterment. That's fine. Yeah. Yeah. If it wasn't winter, I wouldn't. Think about it, but all right. Um, so unless there are further questions or comments, uh, we can consider a motion to close. Uh, and I, I, think, motion. Uh, I missed who the uh, who made the motion. Was it Lisa? Yes, all right. Motion made by Lisa and seconded by who, who did that? Tan. Dan Pearson, seconded by Dan Pearson, close the public hearing. Uh, Going to have to do a roll call vote, beginning with uh, Ron and Lisa. Aye. And I saw an aye coming from Ron and uh, the two Dans, Dan Pearson, Dan Doyle. Aye. Aye. And uh, Carrie. Aye. And I'll throw in an aye. So the motion carries. Uh, I think because this is a very discreet project will have um, closing documents available 
uh, by the end of the meeting. So we're all set. Thank you. Thank you. Our next um, uh, notice of intent is um, DP file number 250-1089. It concerns uh, 133 John Scott Boulevard and it is an application for the construction of a single family home and related septic system. And again, I'm assuming we have a um, representative of the applicant. Yep, this is Cameron Larson with ECR representing the applicant tonight. Um, happy to proceed whenever the commission's ready. I think we're ready. Go ahead, Cameron, you uh, have, you have um, sharing capabilities too. All right, why don't I uh, go ahead and share the, uh, share the plans so we can, uh, you can all see that while I'm chatting about it. I'm pulling that up right now. Yep, we got it. All right. So again, Cameron Larson with ECR representing the applicant to present to you this uh, notice of intent tonight. Um, it's an undeveloped property off John Scott Boulevard. Uh, ECR located a bordering vegetated wetland in a perennial stream to the uh, west and north of the proposed work area on this site. Um, what we are proposing is the construction of a new single family home with septic system, driveway, utilities, small deck in the rear, um, and some grading. Um, now a portion of that work does fall within the 200 foot riverfront area. It cuts through uh, kind of the center of the home here along this dashed line. Um, it stays outside of the 100 foot buffer zone to the wetland associated with the, the stream itself. There is a wetland um, to the south of John Scott Boulevard. Um, can't see on the plan here, but the 100 foot buffer does extend over a small portion of the driveway. Um, so we're working within the riverfront area. We, uh, we've outlined um, compliance with the riverfront area regulations in the narrative. We've situated the home you know, basically as far as possible from the wetland and the, uh, the river that we could uh, while maintaining setbacks, appropriate setbacks for zoning. Um, the work will utilize erosion controls along the limit of work shown as this dash line around the rear of the property. Uh, upon completion of work, we'll, you know, stabilize the work area. Um, what we're showing behind it, the home is just a small area of, of lawn that'll all be stabilized with a, um, environmentally friendly seed mix. We always recommend a, a seed mix high in fescue just because it requires less irrigation. Um, the septic system itself is outside of all the resource areas situated over here. Um, so if, uh, if the commission has any questions regarding this project, I'd be happy to address those. All right, again, uh, with regard to Wetland Protection Act, a uh, relatively limited impact considering much of the project is outside uh, I mean it's the, the riverfront area is the primary issue uh, but as stated in the um, materials it's the amount of impact is below the 10 percent uh, allowed uh, so there's no issue there um, looking for any hands I don't see them but anyone who has uh, any commission member uh, who has a comment? Oh, I, mean, I have a few. Okay, well, why don't you go ahead? Uh, so, Cameron, there's two citations for the flood zone, and the the elevation appears to differ. I think the one says 90, and one says 91. Is that accurate? I mean, does it change through the through the site? Uh, it may it may change through the site itself. Um, we should have included, there should be a, uh, a, you know, a map, the actual FEMA firm map included in the application. Um, regardless, those 90 and 91 elevations are um, well below the wetland line itself. Um, trying to locate them on here. This, this dash right. line kind of cuts down there. So we are keeping all the work outside of that flood zone. Right. But we, since you're asking also for us to um, confirm the resource area on site, we want to make sure that's accurate. So I would ask you to make sure confirm that it's 90 or 91 and change one or the other, please. Um, the other thing is, could you possibly add the street? I didn't see the street address on these plans at all. Um, so if you could add the street address. Um, 
So you mentioned a seed mix for all the served areas. Are there, are there any notes on the plan to that effect? Uh, there's no notes on the plan to the seed mix, but that is, uh, it's noted in the proposed project portion of the narrative. Right, so the contractor's using the plan, not the narrative. So I would suggest that you put the add the seed mix rate and the note to the plan accordingly, and all disturbed areas shall be seeded, and then you can provide the seed mix right in the plan? Not a problem. Okay, and then if you can scroll down, we can look at the um, stabilized exit, which appears to be on the public right away. And not on your property. And I get that because you have a driveway. The, the pavement probably extends past the property line. Um, but I'll ask John Thomas to include a condition um, to make sure that all those stones are removed upon the completion of the project because I can just see them being dislodged in perpetuity all over John Scott Boulevard when you finish. So we'd like to add that as a condition. I don't see that as a problem. That's perfectly appropriate. Okay. Um, okay. So this, this segment fence the limit of sediment control, for some reason, doesn't extend to capture the grading associated with that short retaining wall. Correct. It, it appears they're showing it to the, uh, you know, we've showed it to that 100-foot buffer zone. So, I, you know, if I, I think I see where you're going with it. You know, we can certainly extend that along the edge of the grading just to encompass the entire work area. And, and the well. You want to take the well into that, too. Um, uh, let's see. Then the other thing is you have a... You have an 18 inch silt sock for controls, which is um, a rather large sock with, for not much grading. So um, I would suggest something cheaper off the shelf with probably a 10, 9, 10. I mean, 18 inch is rather large. And it, once it becomes saturated, you can have trouble removing it. So Yeah, the same person that did the, the house to the east used a 12, 12 inch sock. Yep. So I think that would be sufficient here. Okay. Um, and then the other question I had was the post and rail fence is going to be the limit of the yard. Is that really going to be sufficient enough space? Is it all wooded today? I mean, Absolutely. it's not much of a yard and, you know, we constantly see people going past that. So I, I want to make sure that we're giving them adequate space. Yeah, well, it's all wooded at this point. So what we're showing on the plan, it'll be, you know, lawn within the up to the limit of the work area. So, you know, it's about probably a 25, 30 foot lawn, you know, to the north and to the west, I'd estimate. Okay. Uh, I mean, if you think that's sufficient, that, that's fine. But often people always want more space. At this point, um, that's what we're going with and, we're, you know, if, if things change, we'll be, we'll be back in front of you guys with a request. Okay. The isolated vegetated wetland off to the east, the lot that's on the east. Uh, it's on somebody else's property, number one. Number two, did you, did you do the calculations to prove that it was, that it was IBW versus ILSF? If not, I'd ask you to just remove it in its entirety because it's on somebody else's property. So unless you do the calculations to, to support it. That's not a problem. We can remove that. That, you know, that was just a small isolated wetland relocated. and. Uh, within the vicinity of the site, but I understand it's non-jurisdictional, so that can be removed. Okay, and then last but not least, you went through the trouble of telling us it's less than 10% for the riverfront. Could you actually put the percentage so that when we look at it someday quickly, we can just take that number right off the plan? Yep, no problem. I think it's, you know, I don't know, somewhere between yep. six or something percent maybe, but we yep. can uh, just make it easier for us, so. Yep, not a problem. Right. So we have the flood zone taken off the IVW, adding the percentage of riverfront, um, probably changing the size of that sock, and adjusting the said fence. Um, what was that last one? Like adjusting the what? The sediment fence. Yes, to a 12 inch and, and extending. Uh, well, yes. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, not a problem. I, I think that's all okay. appropriate. Those are uh, you know relatively minor changes to the plan. We can we can certainly adjust. Okay, and John Thomas, the um, the just the inclusion of that uh, condition about removing the uh, temporary stabilized exit. Yeah, sediment tracking entrance. Yes. Yeah, we'll okay. put that in there as a condition. Okay, that's all I had, Julian. All right, very good. Um, any other comments from commission members? And if not, we can open the discussion up to 
uh, any audience members who wish to ask a question or make a comment. Uh, again, you can raise your hand in the reaction button, but I don't see any hands raised. So unless we have any further questions, um, I think everything, as I understand it, is submitted in order to close the uh, public hearing. Uh, John, if you could just confirm that for me. Uh, no, they owe us an update form. Yeah, we can we can condition that they provide us those minor changes if, if needed. I mean, I think those requests from Lisa are relatively minor, um, but we can definitely, upon receipt, if the commission feels comfortable with my approval, I can definitely issue that. And that way, they don't have to come back until the next two weeks. I would be fine with that. Yeah, that, would, that would be certainly preferred if, if the commission would be willing to do that. Yep. All right, I think at this point, unless there are further comments, we can entertain a motion to um, close the public hearing for DB file number 250-1089. I'll make that motion. Second. Uh, we have a motion made by uh, Lisa and seconded by Dan Doyle. Uh, we'll do a roll call vote, starting with Ron and Lisa. Aye. Aye. All right, and Dan Pearson and Dan Doyle. Aye. Aye. And Carrie? Aye. And I'll throw in an aye, so the motion carries. Uh, so again, we'll be dealing, we'll be deliberating and dealing with the details of an order of conditions later in the meeting. All right, great. Thank you very much. And we'll, uh, we'll work on getting that revised plan together and over to the commission ASAP. Thank you guys. Have a good night. Thank All right. You. Thank you. Thanks for coming in. So the, um, the next uh, hearing is actually an ANRAD, which is um, uh, a request for a resource area uh, delineation. It's uh, DP file number 250-1090, uh, one Power Street, and it's for proposed plans to verify wetland resource areas. Do we have um, an, a representative of the applicant? Yes, yes, I have here, Michael Larkin here. Right now, uh, again, uh, you're making him co-host, uh, John, I assume. So if you have a plan to put up, that would be great. Yes, Michael, you have co-hosting abilities. Thank you. Can everyone see this plan right now? We can. So this is just a continuation of the, we had gone back and forth through this board and got approved in ORAD for um, Zero West Main Street. And you can see that right here. There was some wetlands on the south of the property, which is actually on the neighbor's property. So we got permission from them to go and firm wetlands on the south of the property, which is their property. We went out on uh, November 11th. We did that. We then had the conservation agent, John, come out on December 8th and he, to verify these lines. And he needed to make a revision on one of them, line 45, or, and I can just show you that one here, maybe a bit clearer. So I just made a revision right here and moved that back. So that was done back on 12 8, 21 So ultimately what we're just trying to do as the board, because he's just trying to do a, a complete study and make sure we have everything on that what may affect us, which is zero West Main Street, this parcel right here. And based on the based on what we see on the other parcel that's adjacent to it. So that's where we're at at this point. And then we're gonna try to move forward with this information to plan the project. All right, any uh, questions or comments from members of the commission? No, I just had a point of clarification. The, our agenda calls out for map 31, parcel 2604. I, I think that's an error for the record. It, is it, it's supposed to be map 22, parcels 21, 2-1, 2-2, and 2-3, correct? That, that's for the old one. This is for Power Street 1 Power Street. So this is it. This is the, the the first one was the those three parcels. This is a different parcel right here. That, oh, this is a different parcel. Yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, that's, sorry. That's, an, that's an error on my part. I'll have that fixed. Yeah. So, oh, ooh, now I'm really confused. Is that parcel shown in in its entirety? I think it looks like we only put the, the portion right here at the very where the the effect. They 
they're only asking confirmation of um, certain flags that are affecting their property. So for instance, they're asking for the uh, availability to have a partial delineation on this property for this. Oh, um, because it projects the buffer. Pro on projects the buffer, but they need to they need it to be precise and accurate. They can't estimate it for okay. the work that they're looking to do. So that was the okay. reason why they needed to associate the accuracy. Okay. All right, thanks for talking about it. Thank you. All right, any other commission member comments or questions? And I'm just gonna survey the participants list for anyone who might have their hands up. Uh, but again, this is a fairly discreet uh, issue. Nobody has their hands up and, and uh, John, as I understand it, uh, all of the uh, information necessary to close this has been submitted. Is that your, uh, you're in agreement with that? That's a fair assessment, Julian. All right. So if that's the case, we can consider a motion to close, um, the hearing for file number 250-1090 concerning the ANRAD on one power street. I make a motion to close. I'll skip. All right, we have a motion made by Lisa, seconded by Dan Pearson. Roll call vote. Again, beginning with, with Ron and Lisa. Aye. Aye. And uh, Dan Pearson, Dan Doyle. Aye. Aye. And Carrie. Aye. And I'll throw in an aye. Um, so uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman and members of the board. Thanks for coming in. Appreciate it. All right, our next uh, item on the agenda is um, a hearing for DP file number. Well, it hasn't got a file number yet. It's a notice of intent. Um, it concerns 6466 West Main Street, and it's a proposed project for reconstruction of two athletic fields, um, I guess, sandwiched between the high school and the um, middle school um so i know we have a representative of the applicant for that so just uh, identify yourself and proceed good evening my name is brie sullivan i'm with dale associates and i have with me tonight i have uh ryan thackery he is the staff engineer that that did most of the work on the drawings and the design and with the um with the school system, I have Joe Bayana, the superintendent of schools, here to answer any questions re regarding um, any input from the schools. So do you have a um, plan uh, that we can refer to during the discussion? Uh, it, if you're made co-host, if you can share or, or not. You have sharing capabilities, Bree. Okay, thank you. Trying to get the plan up. I can't connect to the network, so my network at work. So, have me here. <laughs> Brian, can you share the plan if you have it on your desk, please? Uh, I'm sorry, I have to open that now. I apologize for the delay. Well, that's, that's fine. I mean, this is kind of voluminous, so why don't you begin with a description until the plan is well? There you go. Okay. So, for those of you who are not familiar with the Um, Martin High School and the Yale School property. They, the two properties are but basically abut each other. They have a central uh, entrance. Um, we go to the left, the Yale School's on the left, and on the right, the high school is to the right. So um, what you see here is a, basically an overview of the, um, the fields as proposed. So uh, basically the high school 
So you can see the football field here to, for lack of a better description, to the left, which is to the west. Um, and then the, so the high school is just, just above that, so just to the north of that. Um, you can kind of see the outline of the high school. You can see where the cursor is. Um, the field in the middle here is um, to the west of the L, the center entrance. Um, you'll see the L school on your left, and this field is sort of right directly in front of you before you take the you sort of bare right to the high school. Um, and then you can see where the proposed tennis courts are. Um, that is behind the Yale School. So kind of if you drive behind the Yale School from the left entrance, um, those tennis courts will be where the softball field is now. Um, there's a backstop there, and there's some basketball courts in um, the parking area there behind the Yale School. So that's the orientation of um, where these fields are. Um, as it stands now, The existing, um, the existing layout is the football field is where it's shown here on the plan. There is an existing track and an existing grandstand. The grandstand is, is directly adjacent to where the building is, the high school building. Um, there is a baseball field here in between the football field and the field in the middle. Um, that will remain untouched. Um, the multi-purpose field, which is um, a combination of baseball, softball, and soccer field, which you can see here uh, directly adjacent to the Yale School, um, is going to be going in the same location as there's a multi-purpose grass field there now. Um, and then the tennis courts here is a bank of five tennis courts proposed. Um, those are proposed uh, where there currently is, um, there's a grass area, um, and that's not to be confused with the soccer field that's down here to the east, so, so further away from the drawing. Um, and, and those tennis courts um, will replace the softball field uh, or the practice field that, that exists there now. Um, currently, the, the football field and the multipurpose field are currently uh, turf grass, so natural grass. Um, they are um, in, in fairly decent condition for grass fields that are used. Um, so uh, Ryan, if you could zoom in a little bit on the um, field number one, which is the football field. So we had um, LEC associates do a wetland delineation and a characterization of the resource areas at the site. Um, they actually hung flags along the bordering vegetated wetland. Um, the flags were picked, subsequently picked up by uh, the survey and they're shown on the plans. Uh, we did a site visit. So um, the agent and I did a site visit about a week and a half ago uh, to verify the line. Um, we, we found that, or he found that um, one of the flags should probably be, be, be moved. And so we, we actually moved that. Ryan, if you could, if you could um, pan to the left. Oh, right, right. We need to get to the page that we need to. <clears throat> In any case, you could just show it here. Show it here, Ryan, and I'll, I'll describe where we move the flag. So down in this area, flag A4, we move flag A4 approximately 50 feet upland. Um, and, and actually, uh, so then we drew the line from A3 to the A4 flag, the relocated flag, and we skipped right over flags A5 and A6 and connected it directly to A7. So um, I sent a follow-up plan, um, I believe it was on Friday with the revised flag location. Um, and the updated buffers. So um, field number one here um, has some proposed work within the 25 foot um, no disturb zone. Um, I, I did quantify that and send it out in an email on Friday. Um, currently, the existing field has um, disturbed area in the 25 foot zone. Um, the proposed field 
um, is going to require a little more encroachment into the 25 foot zone with a 12 and a half foot um, offset to the actual BBW line. You can see it there on the right, um, right above the LED athletic light, typical of four, um, 12 and a half feet to that. That is the closest point to the BBW in that location. So Ryan, if you could go to um, the multi-purpose field. So this wetland line continues from west to east. The numbering continues from west to east across the whole southern uh, portion of this site. So this is field two, the one that's adjacent to the Yale School. We can zoom into the wetland area. So the wetland area in this um, part of the property actually extends up in this um, sort of in this projection here um, where wet flags 81 through 89, somewhere thereabouts, actually extends into the existing grass area. Um, the closest that we get to the, the wetland, uh, border vegetated wetland there is 31.4 feet, as you can see the offset here. However, there's going to be some minor grading that grades down. Um, so we're probably talking about 21 feet or so. So we're slightly in the, in the 25 foot. Um, because we have an associated side slope grading. And um, so that's the closest we get to in this field. And uh, if you show the tennis courts, the tennis courts are outside the 100 foot. Maybe they're outside the 50 or the 100 foot. So um, they're not in the jurisdictional area. Uh, before, you, uh, before you go there, could you just indicate to us where the edge of woods is now uh, with okay. that uh, T field, uh, multi purpose uh, field? Okay. And how it compares to, uh, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm an alumnus, if you will, of, of uh, that school when it was the middle school. I don't know if I should be admitting that. But anyway, <laughs> uh, I remember that there was a lot of grass there behind the school. There is. And, uh, and then a forest. And mm -hmm. um, how have we... So that's the line that you're moving the cursor over. That's correct. So the the, the cloud looking line is the is the tree line. Yeah, that's that's not correct, Dan. That's one of the other items. Is that the tree line is actually further south than what's shown on the plan? Oh, okay. Yeah, if you look at the aerial so, imagery, if you go onto Google Earth, you'll notice that that's the case as well. So you're not chopping trees down for this. No, we are not. Okay. It's been, and then that tree line's been like that since I believe the 70s. So, so the question is, Dan, on the other field, are we taking down trees or is it just trimming or how much closer are we at? Not to go back to there, but it mm -hmm. kind of begs the question. Yeah, I think, I think a good thing would be to have that tree line re reevaluated. Now, uh, by the other field, do you mean the tennis courts? Okay, I mean, we'll look at it. It was, it was okay. surveyed by the surveyor. So um, that's, that's actually news to me that it's not in the right location. Um, we'll have to look at that again. Um, if you could go back to field one, please. So you can see that right now, the tree line basically hugs the existing track. So um, the existing track, we probably should, um, Ryan, if you could go back to the, um, the layout plan so we can see where that existing line is. You can kind of see it on the left side going in. We are encroaching further in, into um, the tree line. So there is going to have to be some tree removal mobile here. Hmm. Yeah, that plan there. It's not just that you're doing stuff within the track, you're going beyond the track. We but are going existing, slightly beyond the track the as part of the project. Track. So there's a, there's a track there, well, so that you're creating a walking service 
surface around the perimeter of the existing track where there is none today, is that it? So right now, the existing track as you can see um, here, it's hard to see because of the, sh the spot shots. Um, there's an existing track, and then there's a three and a half foot fence around the outside of the existing track. And then you can see there's a variable width. Um, it's stone dust, so it's a gravel, a gravel path anywhere between eight to ten feet wide that currently exists around the outside of the existing track. So you can't. You know, the, I guess the question is why you have to. Um, further encroach and you can't put it in the same footprint. So is, in other words, is the full so track the reason, itself the getting larger? larger? So the, the track we, is not getting larger. Um, the track, Ryan, correct me if I'm wrong, do we go from six to eight lanes for this or is it is it eight to eight? I think we went six to eight. I think the track is getting slightly bigger. So we're increasing the track so, so the reason why we're increasing from six to eight lanes is for for certain uh, competitions, you're, you're required to have eight lanes. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes you can get away with eight lanes in the straightaway, but in this case, it wouldn't help us here if we just had eight lanes in the straightaway because we would still be we would still be wider and still encroaching. So the Increased width of the formal track surface is pushing out the whole footprint. Correct. That's why you have to. Okay, that's what right. I'm saying. Yeah, okay. I got it. And so, so it quantified that in, in square footage. So currently, the existing encroachment in 25 foot buffer, and this is only for this, this field, is 157 square feet. Um, as it is today, and then the proposed encroachment within the 25 foot buffer, which includes that 157, is uh, just over a thousand, so a thousand a two square feet. Okay, so the, the the width of the swath of trees that has to come down is going to end right at that outer uh, fence. And that's it, that's it, correct. Okay, that's correct. So, is there any any tree trimming? Are there any overhanging branches or in addition to that? I'm just trying to make sure you captured it all because you have the footprint of it itself. But is there? Is there you, you, you can see the tree line here. here. I don't know if you can see the. Right. So, you can, so, are there any overhanging branches that will have to be taken down or trimmed, or is the extent of trimming, clearing, everything to do with tree removal, pruning? the limit of the fence. I guess that's what I'm getting. So that that's correct. Yeah, it is the okay. limit of the fence. There really isn't any reason that you would have to trim uh, a tree um, if it overhangs. Um, you know, the, the construction doesn't require that. But I mean, I'm sure the town wouldn't want overhanging, large overhanging limbs and branches over a public path, though. So. But I guess that's up to the town. Okay. Up to the town. So the bulk of our uh, 25 foot encroachment here is is to the right where the, where the wetland comes very close to the track. Um, in the other areas, it, the encroachment, so you can see, yeah, I'm talking into the tree line. It's minor encroachment into the tree line. Um, we don't anticipate there having to be any trees removed, maybe, maybe a half a dozen or so. Uh, many of the trees in this area are are small. There aren't many large diameter trees up close to the fence. Um, they're they're fairly small, maybe anywhere between four inches, three inches. It's it's basically new growth. Okay. Thank you. So we did it. We did a a um, pre and post analysis as required by the Wetlands Protection Act. Uh, for uh, drainage, and um, the uh, report lists the parameters that we use. And uh, as a result of the pre and post analysis, we uh, have no increase in runoff from any of these locations. I'm, I'm sorry. Could you just repeat that? I only got half the sentence. There's no no increase in something. No stormwater runoff. Stormwater runoff as a result of. Oh, the thank change. you. Thank you. Yeah to the project. So the way we handle stormwater with a um, synthetic turf field, so these, these fields are synthetic turf, 
Um, and the way we handle stormwater runoff with synthetic turf fields is the field itself acts as a detention basin. So the, um, the synthetic turf field is constructed of uh, basically um, a layer of stone anywhere between 12, 10 to 12 inches, depending on where you are in the field. Um, they then lay the, um, for lack of a better term, we call it carpet because it's, it's very often, several manufacturers are actually carpet manufacturers. The um, artificial turf carpet on top of the laser graded stone um, and the laser graded stone has um, an underdrain system. The underdrain system collects the runoff, brings it to discharge structures on either end of the field. Um, and those discharge structures actually have a riser in them, which allows the water to basically stage up under the field um, and be stored um, such that it can infiltrate into the ground below the field. Um, in um, larger storm events, um, the, the water will overflow the riser. So this is all underground. Um, it's all in outlet control structures. Um, and it will discharge to two existing discharge points for field one. Um, and field two, the discharge points are, are actually um, an overflow with a beehive grate. So when the storm exceeds the capacity of the stone under the field, it will overflow um, these, these two structures in, in field two. Um, and so there is sufficient storage under the field to attenuate any runoff increase from the field. So, the, so essentially, uh, turf fields are like porous pavement. They basically let the water right through into the stone, um, the stone reservoir below. So that's how we handle storm water. <clears throat> you just, I'm sorry, could you just point out the, the, the points where it's discharges? If they're existing, existing to be reused, it sounds like. So they are existing to be reused. Um, if you could zoom in, Ryan. Or do you have a grading and drainage plan? We do. We do have a grading and drainage yeah. plan. Yeah, I off to get to the, the grading plan. Yeah. There you go. So you can see here to the east and the west, we have the outlet control structures and these invert outs, they're existing. We're connecting to the existing pipe that comes out of the, the um, existing catch basins on the field. Okay, so that manhole cover is gonna be at grade on that public or on that walking path, we'll call it? That's correct. Okay. Is that ADA compliant? Like, not that it's in my business, but. It is, it is. Okay. With a, yep. with a manhole cover in the middle of the path. Yep, All compacted right. gravel as long as you don't have any sort of, um, you know, any sort of, they call it lippage, um, okay. where, where the, the manhole cover sticks up above. So. Okay. So now, Ryan, if you could um, zoom out a little bit, I'll just, it just gives a view of the underdrain system, and then the underdrain system goes to a collector pipe that goes around the field, and then that's collected by the outlet control structure, and it discharges. Um, at, at the higher storm events. The lower events are, are wholly retained under the field. You will not see any discharge um, out of the pipes um, from the field. So you can see these dashed lines that are sort of like in a chevron pattern. Those are the under drains. They, uh, they collect the water um, from underneath the field and convey it to the perimeter drainage pipe. Um, the perimeter drainage pipe is perforated to allow percolation into the surrounding soil, um, and then they eventually terminate at the outlet control structures. So the track is graded towards the field. Everything's graded towards the field, so we don't have any discharge off the field. Um, this stormwater runoff is considered clean. It's like roof runoff that you're typically used to seeing in, in um, drainage projects because there's no vehicular um, loading on this property. It's all um, direct runoff from like a sidewalk. Um, so we treat it as clean. It doesn't have total suspended solids in it or whatever total suspended solids it would have would be minimal. So if you could go to field two, please, Ryan. So field two is similar in design 
for stormwater handling. We have the stone reservoir with an underdrain system. Uh, the underdrain system conveys it to a perimeter pipe, and the perimeter pipes go to actually three discharge locations. So the three discharge locations are essentially just a vertical pipe with a, a beehive grate on top. You may have seen them. Um, they fit on top of the pipe. Um, and once the stormwater reaches a certain elevation in the stone, it'll overflow the pipe and then um, flow towards the resource area to overland flow. Now this area also has a boarding land subject to flooding. Um, it's actually the the um, the rest of the project is is buffer zone only, with the exception of the 25 foot no disturb. Um, there is BLSF here. Uh, it's a zone A BLSF, so there's no elevation. Um, there's been no elevation uh, provided. So we kind of had to do an overlay from the flood map to determine where in the fields. Uh, we're encroaching into the zone. There is a slight encroachment. Um, I did a uh, quantity takeoff. Ryan did a quantity takeoff. Um, we have about 1,680 square feet of BLSF. We didn't have that on the original form, so that um, will have to be added to the order of conditions. Um, the 1,680 square feet approximately um, will result in, so it, it occurs approximately between 108 and 109. It's hard to tell. Um, because we don't know exactly where it is. Um, the volume is expected to be 800 and cubic, 840 cubic feet of uh, fill in the flood zone. So um, as a point of contrast, um, I looked at the volume and the rate of stormwater runoff post conditions. And we actually have a reduction um, of runoff volume from the field, for this field only, um, of 880 cubic feet. So we're actually reducing the volume of stormwater runoff in a 100-year storm by 880 cubic feet, which is greater than the 840 cubic feet that we're filling to construct the field. Um, we also uh, wanted to make sure that in constructing this field that we're not going to create a condition where it gets flooded out. Um, because we're raising the elevation there, um, we are not concerned with uh, the likelihood of it being flooded out is, is small. So one, one second. So you're not providing compensatory flood storage on an incremental foot by foot basis for the regs. Can you address that? So we are not. Um, we are, um, the reason why we are, it's difficult to do that is, is it's difficult to estimate how much we're, we're filling, but because we're not, um, you know, the offset setting mitigation factor is the amount of runoff that we're discharging during the hundred year storm, um, which is what the zone A is, um, is greater than the amount we're filling in the flood zone. I'm, okay, I'm not sure that meets the performance standards of watering lands up to flooding, but um, I'm going to ask, ask you to look at that and did you address conformance with the standards in the document? Excuse me? Can you did you address me? conformance with the standards for uh, filling flood, flood zone in the document? I addressed it in the email on Friday that I sent out for additional information. Okay. John Thomas, would you have a chance to review that yet? I've been scrambling around for this meeting. I haven't had real much time okay. to look at all that stuff. Okay, we'll take a look at that. All right. It's actually another thing I wanted to ask uh, the commission is if they want to have a peer review consultant take a look at this project too. Uh, that would be a resounding yes on my end because I am not a yes. I don't see why not. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So I guess Mr. or uh, whoever it is, we, we rely on Chessica or whoever the peer review consultant is, we can ask them to uh, review compensatory storage uh, performance standards as well, John. Okay, I'll uh, 
put some potential. I have a couple proposals. I'll send okay. them over to the commission. Okay. All right, Bree, have you completed your your comments? So I would just like to speak to um, the the, the um, impact to the twenty five foot zone, no disturbance. Um, so what we're proposing to uh, mitigate the additional encroachment to the 25 foot, so that encroachment is in field one. Um, what we're proposing to do is to uh, create a vegetation management area um, to the south of field two, you can see it here, which is um, around the buffer of this piece of wetland that comes into the field. Um, that will approximately be an 11 to 1 mitigation to impact um, ratio. Um, and so what that will allow is so, so um, it will allow this area to go back to natural vegetation um, and it'll be um, it'll be delineated by sign saying vegetation management area. Um, what we've did, what we've done is we've we've actually not put a walkway around this part of the field. We want to discourage people from using the area or from walking in the area um, to disturb, you know, to maintain the, the, the um, growing conditions to protect protect the uh, resource area. So you're not planting anything, you're just going to let it naturally revegetate? That's correct. So what will be, uh, is the, how are you going to, um, I guess, corner it off or you're going to put, so you're going to surround it with a fence or something to allow it to vegetate? We could, we could, we could put a we could put a temporary fence in there or a permanent fence, whichever. We could do a post and rail fence. I don't I don't want to discourage any sort of um, wildlife wildlife passage in the area. Um, if the commission has a preferred method of of, um, of delineating that in addition to signs, um, we certainly would be amenable to um, suggestions. Yeah, we'll have to think about that one. Okay. Yeah. I, um, when you imagine there'd be a lot of people uh, wandering off the site to the south uh, during at the middle of game or in the middle of the game to uh, do what everyone does in I don't know. Uh, and you went here, didn't you wander back there at some point and do something? You know, I went to I went to the middle I went to the middle school, oh. not the uh, high school. Uh, <laughs> But uh, yes, I mean, um, well, I mean, it, maybe it will be nothing serious and uh, not that big deal. I, I don't know. Um, cigarette butts and uh, who knows. Well, maybe we can ask John to make a recommendation since the tree line here is going to be adjusted anyway, right? So, how, how, you know, we'll think about how much of an area, what width we want, and, and how we want to. Um, um, keep people from wandering in there until it revegetates. It will also preclude from any disposal of litter, trash, debris, landscape material, whatever you might find out there. So I think it's definitely a positive thing um, for everybody. I mean, if we had some sort of barrier or fence or something, a significant barrier or fence. I mean, if yeah, I mean, if, if that's the best way to do it, we'll, we can we can certainly do that. I know it's pretty wet in there. Anybody who goes back there is going to be wet. They're going to get their feet wet. So I think that automatically discourages. And once the vegetation establishes, is I wouldn't be going back there. <laughs> so, um, um, but it's certainly something that that we are, are willing to willing to do. All right. Well, it it, I mean, the way it sounds, it's almost if if the area is not maintained as an open grass area, that within a short time, there's going to be a lot of uh, vegetation that will naturally invade, and it grows very quickly. Mm -hmm. I mean, if 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 the the commission um, feels that it would be better managed as um, as a, a pasture, 
then we would have to have some sort of um, O and M with um, you know twice yearly or once yearly mowing. Um, I've I've seen pasture management plans that that typically have you know twice yearly with the with the, the special equipment, um, and that will prevent the brush layer from growing um, and the tree layer from growing um, to keep it as a pasture. I mean that might be something that's worthwhile. Um, I guess it's you know something we can look at to see you know what would be best suited here otherwise you know I think eventually we'd see we'd see a tree layer established here and maybe that's what we want to do but I thought some of the information submitted indicated that part of that open area is in fact wetland it is it is yeah so I don't see the benefit of maintaining it as as managed grass well, um, I'm only referring to the area in the 25 foot zone that we're proposing to to uh, use as mitigation. So not not the wetland area, of course. It would be the the border the border to that. It sounds to me that it would be a good idea to have it hatched out on a plan. That way, you can kind of distinguish the different boundaries. I think sure. what Julian's trying to get at is he doesn't want to um, compile this in with already areas that are already wetlands. So if we could have areas that are designated outside the mm -hmm. wetland identified on a site plan as a management area, that would be very beneficial okay. for this project. Okay, we can do that. So uh, any further questions or comments from commission members? So Bree, you've, you've completed your presentation, is that correct? I have, if there's no further questions. Um, uh, well, we didn't really uh, go into the question of tennis courts. Yeah. Tennis courts are outside the resource area and outside the buffer. Okay. And that takes care of that. Uh, and, you know, there was discussion of the proposed um, stormwater management plan um, being reviewed by a consultant. So um, I don't know if that's something we take up in the process of the public hearing or, or outside of it um, but it sounds like we need to have a continuation so that we can address that yeah i also have uh, many comments so i'm thinking the most efficient way for me might be to put together a list um, give it to john thomas and then the uh, applicant can address the, my comments maybe at the next hearing in an effort to not drag this on for another hour, <laughs> um, if that's okay. I think everyone on this call would appreciate that. All right, I will not drag you through three pages of comments. I will write them up. Um, but the one question I do have, um, and I can continue my comments on this until I know the answer to this, is, the very top layer of the field is it those rubber pellets is it the coconut the core um fibers what what is the very top layer i didn't see that on the detail it just kept saying um synthetic synthetic so can you describe what the um the top layer is going to consist of the top the top layer is is in fact sbr rubber which is a common um ground ground uh, post-consumer rubber Recycled that that they use in the vast majority of these fields. It's the infill. It, it keeps the fibers of the turf standing up, um, and that's there are um, alternative infills. Um, they're about twice the cost of the SBR rubber. They've been using SBR rubber in for 20 years. We've used the Gale and Designs for 20 years. It's been used everywhere. So it's the I want to get this straight. It's those little tiny rubber rubber pellets. That anytime the ball hits the surface, they become dislodged. They become airborne. There's thousands, hundreds of thousands of little tiny rubber black pellets. Is that right? That's correct. That's correct. Yeah. I don't think you've ever played on that surface because you end up with it in your cleats, in your shoes, in your clothes, on your dog. You end up with it in your house. From everything I've read about it, um, it actually has carcinogenic properties. They recommend that children not sit on the sidelines and touch it and then put their fingers into their mouth. Um, I've seen both types of fields and I would never recommend this type of field. 
The other thing is, you know, if it's going to be subject to flooding, you're going to have floating. Um, you're going to have floating material. I think if the uh, superintendent hasn't seen both of these fields, that they should absolutely go and visit both types of fields. Um, cost aside, it's an obnoxious media to put on a field. I think after having been to dozens and dozens of field hockey games on this type of field, it is obnoxious. The pellets are obnoxious. So I must um, say. <laughs> so th that is a common um, that is a common issue with all infill. So whether you have an alternative infill or you have SBR rubber, which is what most fields have. Um, there, there is the infill gets in everything. It's it's part of um, part of how this how it works. But the uh, material that was the core or the, the the coconut fiber was not nearly as um, messy and disturbing as as I mean you end up with these pellets in your house. There's no doubt about it. Mm -hmm. You end up um, tracking them everywhere in your car, in your house. They're all they're in my in my house now. My daughter hasn't played field hockey in five years. I can point to them. <laughs> Just, um, I want the town uh, as a superintendent to be aware of, they should probably go and look at fields that have both. I would encourage you to do that because it's it's not a pretty sight. Um, I, I, would, I would ask you to look at the spec sheet in the MSDS sheet for these because I believe they have carcinogenic properties, like I said. And they said, if you take your children to the field, don't plunk them down, sit there with, because they will inevitably want to pick this stuff up and put it in their mouth. We can provide you with with um, lab studies that show that it's not carcinogenic. Yeah, well, that's going to be it's not my decision. It's up to the superintendent, and I just want them to be informed to see both uh, mm -hmm. types or many types of fields, and not just this one because it's the cheapest. That's I all. mean, if if it's the concern of the commission for safety, um, we have documentation that is in fact been tested by labs and that it's not unsafe. Jury's out on that, but okay. I've done a lot of research on it. I end up in my house. <laughs> so uh, that's up to the superintendent and the town's, town's taxpayer dollars, but um, I would not recommend it. But in, in the end, it's not my call. I'm just here to permit the field. So I would defer to the superintendent. Well, uh, could I say if, if it's going to end up potentially in, in kids' mouths, what is going to the. Uh, it, it does the end up in kids' mouths. I used to play lacrosse on an artificial field in high school. And there's no way around it. It does get in your face and in your well, It's going to keep it away from the wildlife. I that I want to know as well. I mean, the kids, yes, but also we're supposed to be concerned about, you know, the the life in the wetland uh, and to the south of the project. Um, yeah, but, I mean, is there any chance in a flood of that being carried off into the wetland of, of running off in uh, during a rain event? Yes, I exactly. I, 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 oh. I mean, I, yeah, I I've seen it accumulate in piles after major events. It ends up in the corner and you have to re-sweep it and continuously keep it up. But again, I'm going to defer to the superintendent. So part of the part of the field maintenance is to, to groom the field on a regular basis. It's part of the operation and maintenance of the field. Um, it, it does build up in areas. It builds up near in front of the nets. You'll see a, 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 a bit of it that builds up there. It has to be redistributed. Uh, it's part of the, the, the maintenance of the field. Yeah. Okay. I'm just giving you my opinion. Um, so the field has a east. slot drain. Yeah. The field has a slot drain all the way around the outside perimeter. So any sort of um, uh, infill, no matter what kind of infill it is, that gets carried to the edge of the field in a flashy storm, and we see it occasionally, um, it has to be a very flashy storm. Um, the permeability of this carpet is, or of the turf, is exceptionally high. Um, we don't typically, we use the same carpets in Florida. We do designs in Florida where it, the, the rainstorms are much more intense. Um, and it, it's, it's not common that you see migration of the infill. Um, it doesn't float. Um, it, it may float under a flashy storm. Um, in a windy condition, but it's not common to do that. Um, and anything that would be carried to the edge of the field would go into the trench drain and be caught by the sump. So the sump catches it. It's a it's a piece that you take out. You can empty. Um, we've seen that it does. Yeah. So that so that right becomes there, um, So that is yeah. the uh, first. That is the first line of defense 
for it getting into the wetland. The second line of defense is um, the under drain system that it goes through. It, it's not going to reach it to the out, outlet control structures. There are several barriers between between the two. Um, we have seen a little bit of carryover, but typically what that is is um, the granules on top of the track surface. Sometimes some of them get carried over, um, but that is EPBM rubber, which doesn't have the same um, type of composition that that the SBR rubber does. That's a different thing altogether. Yeah. So, um, but I've seen a lot of these and it, it doesn't carry over too often, but it would be impossible to say that it wouldn't in some degree, but it's small. I'm just saying there are options that are a lot cleaner, less messy, and don't end up in your house. And I'm just saying they're gonna be, they're gonna eat this stuff, but just so as long as the town knows, if they've never seen this before, they need to go see one. They need to go witness it. So, all right, I, I can put all my notes together um, and send them to John. Thomas. We, we, we want to, Lisa, will they include, we'll do what the town wants to do. Will mm -hmm. they include what you just said, Lisa, I hope, some of what you just said about the uh, uh, coconuts or whatever it is. <laughs> yeah, the, there's, uh, there's, there's all kinds of, of top, top course media for this. There's all kinds of solutions. This one just happens to be the cheapest, and that's why people do it. Um, but it's not the best, in, in my viewpoint, from a many well, perspectives. But I, you know, we could always uh, never mind. Uh, we've we've done many of the alternative infills. We've 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 done um, every alternative infill that there is able to be used. We've specified on jobs. We have experience with them. They have other requirements. Um, several of the alternative infills require a watering system which means you have to wet them down on a periodic basis. Otherwise they dry out and they fly away. Yeah. Um, so there's pros and cons for every system. Um, and we certainly can discuss those options um, with, with the school if they're willing. Um, we have experience with them and we'd be glad to discuss that. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I mean, I think technically that material is not within our purview under the Wetlands Protection Act. Since well, well, it is if it's potential. It is in the birds and the fish. Well, it's potential uh, pollutant. And a p potential pollutant, especially drinking water, although Ms. Sullivan did mention that it flows in whatever, the yeah. uh, the drain there. But, um, but it appears it appears there is a a containment system for this material. Is that a fair Yes, but it's not foolproof, Julian. And like I said, you know, I just want the town to know there are options. And I don't know if you pre if Gail presented the superintendent with, okay, here are the options, X, Y, and Z. Here are the pros, here are the cons. As the consumer, that's what I would want to know. As a tax dollar, you know, taxpayer, that's what I would want to know. Was that presented to the town? And if not, I think it should be. So like any other project, there's an O&M plan for this. There's okay. going to be a stormwater report. There's going to be inspections. There's going to be requirements in the future order of conditions. We could put a condition in there saying that they need to provide, you know, reports on these outlet control structures to make sure that they're clean, clean and free of all this, um, you know, material. And if not, then we need to know, you know, when it's being cleaned out. So it's kind of like any sort of stormwater management um, pollution prevention plan. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, that's a given no matter what's selected. I'm talking taking two steps back and giving the town the opportunity to select a uh, a top course. Right. I mean, you've got to weigh the options for the overall maintenance and then, you know, the initial construction costs and see which one outweighs whatever. Yeah. And if it's more of a hassle to do the cheaper option and then have more maintenance in the long term, obviously, yeah. you know, it might be worth investigating in other opportunities. I guess it's too late to buy more books for the library. <laughs> All right. So, uh, as from my perspective, I'm assuming we're going to need to select uh, a consultant or at least start that process um, to assess the design and any potential recommendations that the consultant might make. 
good to me. I'm all for it. Uh, Bree, I'm assuming the applicant would be amenable to that. But I do want to mention that um, I don't know what the timeline looks like. Um, uh, preferential pricing for, for bids is, is best done early in the year. So um, whatever the timeline is, I, I just want to impress upon the commission that um, um, while doing due diligence, you need to do your due diligence, um, uh, and we want you to do your due diligence, um, just that this is a time sensitive process. Um, the longer we get into the, the bid season, um, the, the higher the prices go for contractors. So um, it's, it's sensitive. I just want to uh, let the commission know that this, it's not a process that we have until, you know, um, it's time sensitive. That's all I want to say. Yeah, well, it just came to us. So, you know, we're, you'll get it when you get it. We'll be mindful of the timing, but, you know, I'm not going to be rushed into this because That's all I'm asking is just be mindful. Right. Just, right. just so you're informed and you know. Filed a month ago. I, you know, I don't know. So. Well, yeah, well we, we received we received one proposal, and you know I can send that over to you to see if you're will if and you see if you and your client are willing to accept that. I'm still waiting two more proposals back, um, but if you're willing to accept that proposal, we can move forward with the uh, the process as of tomorrow, provided that the commission accepts that. All right, so. Uh... I think unless there are further questions, we can we can close. We have uh, specific a list of questions that's going to be submitted through John Thomas, and um, so we can consider unless there are other issues to be brought up right now, consider a motion to continue. Um, our next meeting is January tenth. We, I'm presuming that the consultant will be very much involved and maybe even have a report by that. So unless there is further question or comment, I'm going to uh, call for a motion to, for continuation. I'll make a motion to continue for uh, 64-66 West Main Street. Second. All right. We have a motion made by Lisa and seconded by uh, Ron for a continuation of this hearing until January 10th. Um, and there will be further discussion with regard to uh, selection of a proposed consultant later in the meeting. So roll call vote. Uh, we'll start with uh, Ron and Lisa. Aye. Aye. And Dan Doyle and Dan Pearson. Aye. Aye. And Carrie. Aye. And I'll throw in an aye as well. So thank you everybody for participating in the discussion. Uh, and there's a lot more to come. Uh, so our next um, item, uh, we're now going into um, uh, hearings that have been come before us uh, on, in some cases, multiple prior occasions, in particular, file number 250-1070 concerning Zero Rear Eddy Street. Uh, do we have a, uh, looks like Tim, uh, representative? Yes, good evening, everyone. For the record, Tim McGuire, I'm a wetland scientist with Goddard Consulting here on behalf of the owner and applicant, Shercourt, who is on the hearing tonight. I'm also joined by Scott Garner from my office, who will likely be assisting with the presentation as well tonight. So since our last hearing, we've had the opportunity to just today submit some more sub supplemental information to the commission. And I can do a quick screen share of that. So in this letter that the commission received today, we further looked into the pond versus river status. The commission had questions in regards to when the outlet control structure was put in place and if it was prior to the Wetlands Protection Act in the 80s, which it was. We've shown, we've demonstrated that through showing 
aerial photography from the 60s of the pond as such. In 61 and 65, we've also included a plan sheet from the Department of Transportation from December of 1965, which shows the outlet control structure and the pond created by it here. So in addition to that, we found another project in Norton from 2008 off Fairley Lane in which a very similar issue was previously discussed. So on Fairley Lane, what we have here is the USGS showing a pond right in between a perennial stream that stops at the northwestern point here and then flows out of the pond from an outlet control structure very similar to our Locust Meadow Brook Pond. So it was determined, and there's an ortho of that as well. So the stream, you can't really see it from this picture, but it comes down through here, just like the USGS, and out in outlet control structure. During the issuance of a superseding or, order of resource areas on the issue, the wetland resource area boundaries were confirmed that the perennial stream did indeed stop where the pond began here with only the 100 foot buffer zone being drawn off of the pond. So this is the northern end. And then we have the southern end here with the outlet control structure and the uh, roadway. And then therefore the mean annual high water of the perennial stream uh, resumed here and is drawn off of the point at the southeast of the pond itself. So it's our professional opinion that this is an instance in which we have a perennial stream flowing into a pond stopping at the pond and then resuming after an outlet control structure, which is nearly identical to Meadowbrook Pond here in Norton as well. So this is, well, this is, this is a Scott Goddard, if I could just interject on that. Um, so I was the wetland scientist for the Fairley Lane project back maybe 15 or so years ago when this application was brought forth. And I recall walking the site with, uh, Gary McCutch and Jennifer Kalina on the, the solar issue and we're discussing the, the status of this pond and where to stop it, the river, where to start the pond, uh, et cetera. And one thing of, of note on this, this pond, this pond was created to hold back some water that could service, service cranberry bogs and it was 100% controlled in this case by removable uh, board, wooden weir boards. So that with the removal of the board, this of the boards, this stream would very quickly revert to a center line stream channel flowing flowing through the middle of what is labeled on this plane as a pond. And only when the boards were in place and the pond was at a high elevation would give the appearance on the ground of a pond. You know, that, that very well seems as though it could be the case on the present project before you that we have this outlet control structure that's controlled by uh, a weir. It's the only reason the pond is there is because of the weir. The weir predates the Wetland Protection Act, but it's shown in the USGS map as a pond, and therefore, barring evidence of it showing primarily riverine characteristics, then the, it's presumed to be treated as a pond and that was validated by by the department so here we have not only depicted as a pond but also even labeled with a pond a pond name so that that i thought i thought of that sorad case from fairly lane because one it shows an independent validation from the department two it's a very similar type of pond where it was built by a weir within the middle of a perennial stream kind of, um, you know, channel, and also because, um, yeah, because of being in Norton as well. You know, so it was, it was very relevant, and some of the board members here, uh, you know, I think maybe in Lisa, you, you guys might have been around during, during the, the, those days. So, so um, anyways, that, that was my recollection from the 21 Fairly Lane Project and how it relates to this one. Sorry, Tim, go no, oh, thank you for that. And that's all the new information that we have in this most recent submittal for today. And we'd be happy to continue discussions with the commission at this time. All right. Um, 
further questions or, or comments from members of the commission? John Thomas, can you cue? So I did some research today, and on the historic aerials, it appears that between 1888 and 1940, the river was the river was the river. There was a pond. However, it was only, um, and I estimated this, between six and 700 feet west of 140. So it was really clear that there was a river that emptied into a pond. But the pond did not extend back as far as we're showing it today. It's really clear on um, the historic aerials. Sometime in 1944, it looks like um, the quad map all of a sudden started showing that um, a larger area, probably because of the impoundment. Um, but you can clearly see the sinuosity on those historic aerials and also um, on the 2010 um, Google Earth image, when the, the flow was really low, you can still see the, the center line of the, of the stream itself. Um, oh, so John, did you download the... Um, Historic aerial. Um, yeah, so this, this this is the topo from 1944 here that you wanted to show. Um, uh, no, I actually wanted to show everything up to 1944. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, we can show we can show okay. this we can show the stuff from the 1880s if you want to. Well, between eight, right, my point is between there was always a pond there. No one's suggesting that there was never a pond there. This right. is what's indicative of of the site between 1888 and 1940, it was really clear that there was a stream channel, a sinuous channel up to this location. And, and, and you can, the measuring function on the historic aerial photo website, it's between, I don't know, six and 700 feet from 140. So that's me, it tells me that there was a river up to that point and that's where the river enters the pond. Um, John, can you can you look at the 2010 Google Earth image, which speaks volumes? Yes. I think. Give me I'm one having second. to jump all over the place. I know. Yeah, I have to change applications here. Okay. It's really clear when there was uh, very low water that year, how far the river goes. I think it's about to the point where it starts to. Uh, it's about to the point where it was in the in the. Um, Pre-1940. Right, but, uh, but I'm not understanding. If, if we have one unusual weather event in which the level of the pond is, is low, does that necessarily establish? No, Julian, what I'm trying to prove, what I'm trying to show is you can clearly see there's a river in there. There's a river. There's no doubt about it. There's no doubt about it that there's a river. In but the is that how? There you go. It, is that how the Wetland Protection Act defines the application of riverfront riverfront requirements? It has you know, riverine characteristics. Now, if you look at this, you can follow it almost to the point where it gets deeper, right? About six to seven hundred feet west of one forty. Right, but, but but the normal condition is not at that level of water. Because it's artificially ponded. That's why. But you still have a river. There's still a river under there. You can see it clear as day. Well, it's right there. But all, Just because it's impounded and flooded doesn't mean there's a river under there. There's still a thread oh, in the river. Okay. But all um, impoundments that are not natural in the state of Massachusetts also would have that feature. Certainly the reservoir that I'm next to was was impounded, yet there still is no um, a riverine requirements. It's it's uh, at, at the edge, It's there is no riverfront requirement here. So are you saying that there is a riverfront requirement on Meadowbrook Pond? I believe that the river empties into the pond proper. I believe there is a river there based on the research that I did on my own. 
that's my professional opinion is that there's been a river there since 1888 that emptied into a pond but it's with regard river. but with regard to the application of riverfront mm -hmm. are you saying that there has to be riverfront around the entire meadowbrook pond at the point where it empties into the pond that's where it would end where it right okay. thank you john thomas is that john thomas no that's that me. that's <laughs> this, this that's, is tim. Tim. that's tim tim tim's gonna brief so, us in this so, so it, in, in, res, in response to your comments if i may the, the wetland yeah. protection act and the riverfront area Re, uh, regulations articulates that where rivers flow through lakes or ponds, the riverfront area stops at the inlet and begins at the outlet. So similarly to the Fairly Lane project, it is it, it, it is clear that prior to the 1900s, the river was a river, but just like in Fairly Lane, as it was artificially dammed up and has been maintained as such since prior to the Wetland Protection Act, we're basing our assertion off of the existing conditions of the pond, which do, with the exception of the outlier year in 2010, appear to be consistent. Oh, it's this one. Consist I don't think that was an outlier year. I think that was just the water was says, drawn down and exposed the fact that it's still a river. Still a river. Yeah, and you you have to look at the primarily you know the, the primary characteristics. So we're looking at whether or not it has primarily riverine characteristics. And I'm not sure that we've seen that it doesn't. Um, you know, I have a so rad from I've seen a so rad from another town where it's an impoundment with a dam that's been there since the 1800s, um, and it's considered a river by Mass DEP, even though USGS says it's a pond. Um, it has the same sort of linear um, features as Meadowbrook Pond, so I. I'm just not sure. I, I, I'm not the expert, but I'm not sure that that we've been shown that this is truly a pond. And at this point, you know, we're doing the best we can as a commission. Um, you know, I happen to know where to look to find stuff, but um, at this point, I would probably want to defer this to DEP because if you ask my professional opinion and as opinion as a board member, I'm thinking this river goes to the footprint of where the pond shows up. Regardless of the impoundment, six to seven hundred feet west of one forty. Well, Lisa, this is Scott again. Uh, could yeah. you, could you bring up that map that you were referring to, and maybe yeah. with a pointer yeah. show where you're um, where you're thinking it may? Yeah. So there's a series of historic maps. If you go on historic aerials from 1888 to 1940, it clearly yep. shows river to the pond. John Thomas, do you have that? Yeah, which which map do you want, Lisa? Do you have a historic aerials um, yeah, website? Yeah, give me one. Open. I don't have the historic aerials website, no. I have the USGS uh, map. Do you want the historic aerials? I have to go on historic aerials. Well, John, wasn't there, wasn't there a picture that... Yeah, it's the same website. Saying, Lisa was yeah. referring to, uh, you had up on your screen earlier, Sure, it shows the drawn down uh, pond, and you could see part of the riverbed under the left hand side of it more. Yeah, so you want Google Earth. That's what that you want. That was the 2010 Google Earth stuff. Yeah, this is what you're looking at. All right. So, yeah. so Lisa, on this one here, if I could just, you know, maybe, maybe just help to clarify for my purposes. You know, if it's using the letters as a reference where it says Meadowbrook Pond yeah. or something like yeah. that, where, where are you pointing to that, that is uh, suggesting that? It, the riverine characteristics may potentially cease. Well, it, well, it's not exactly, this is not gra exactly great clarity, but I would take it until it's over to the east. I think it's just obscured by more water. I think it, it, it almost looks like it empties right into there. Is it, it, it keep going to the east? It, it, it right there. It's almost like a little mini delta where it just spills into the low point of the pond right there. And that's about where the historic um, topos had it. If that measures 600 feet from 140. I mean, I, we shouldn't be doing this now, people, but you know, this is kind of what I asked you to do. <laughs> yeah, you, 
The historic showed it six, six, between six and six fifty. So, so if we can, I don't know if John Thomas has that queued up, but we really shouldn't be doing due diligence on, on a plan of public care. So, no, I'd appreciate it if you could do it if you want to take a look at them. Scott. No, no, I, I understand. I understand what you're saying, and I guess I'd, you know it'd be helpful to hear from the balance of the commission. Yeah. But before this goes off to DEP, you know, I think, you know, under, understanding what you're suggesting, Lisa, there may be an opportunity, for, you know, if we kind of look to try to maybe trace that yeah. center line so that it's more where that channel is and seeing how that would affect the project if, if that all could kind of still work. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, I assume, Scott, that that was going to be part of your strategy, just in case it is further from that you would figure out is this a viable project oh, you know oh i i will say yeah. going back to that fairly project again and i don't know if you remember being out there lisa but that also had a channel that was very visible during the drawdown and we did we did draw it down at one point to see what would happen mm -hmm. and there's a as clear as day a channel going right from one end of that thing to the other like like a center, center line through that pond dep dep's position was the top board of the weir where that backwater to was the design elevation of the pond and that's therefore what the pond should be so you know it, it's not the low water condition that we're looking at that defines where the pond is mm -hmm. i think it's the normal high level um not the extreme high level but the normal high level in other words where that water would pop over the the weir and maybe another thing we could look at then is okay what's the what's the what's the elevation of the top of that weir um in this pond and chase that elevation back and see where that puts us for a water surface that might be another uh, useful piece of data to to if, if the commission's willing to use the same logic that was applied 15 years ago at the fairly so i guess my only point is that there are other there, there are other dep decisions that don't agree with the way fairly went. um so i, I just i think we need more A lot more examples. I mean, this was, I don't know. This was I, the only I, one I, I could find that was local to town. Right. There's so many situations that are nearly identical and local to the town. I thought that I know, was but pretty... the one I've the one I've looked at is also nearly identical. It's in Walpole. It's Bird Pond. It's it's called a USG. It's called uh, a pond by USGS, but it's it's been considered a river by DEP, and it has a riverfront area um, attached to it, and it looks very similar to Meadowbrook. In fact, Meadowbrook is actually more sort of um, sinewy. So, uh, you know, I just, we, we need to be able to defend uh, our decision. You know? So Scott, that's why DEP gets paid the big bucks and we, we don't, you know, so. <laughs> anyway, I disagree with you on that one. <laughs> you know, I would, I would agree with Scott they, on that one. They're gonna DEP disagree. Doesn't, they don't like being, you know, uh, throwing everything as a difficult decision. You know, these processes that we're in right now, you know, every day and have to deal with difficult decisions. And I'm not suggesting this is easy or super straightforward. I get it that it's that it's challenging. Um, but I'd be curious to hear from the other members of the commission or John if you had other thoughts on this so we can decide how to move forward. Oh, did you ask John? I'm sorry. Well, just to see if there's other feedback that hasn't been mentioned mm -hmm. on this topic so that we can make a decision on how best to move, move this forward. I don't know. I've been back on for, back and forth on this a couple of times. I know it's been going on for almost a year, the, the entire application or notice of intent. But um, right now, I, I'd say um, I think it's a stream. Or a river, river from. To, to its entire course or to the point that Lisa was referring to? Up until the point that Lisa was referring to, but, and I understand that's, you know, low water um, or can consider, be considered low water, but that's still what's underneath the pond when the water is high. And, um, yeah, the body is full. All right, I'm I'm going to um, weigh in on my interpretation. 
uh, clearly a distinction was made between a flowing river and um, areas where the water does not flow anywhere near as rapidly. And the, the decision by the regulations was that we don't apply riverfront definition to those areas where the water is not fl flowing rapidly. Um, one of the things that I have enjoyed about the Wetlands Protection Act is there really is not the kind of ambiguity uh, with regard to at least defining what we're dealing with as can be present in some other areas. Um, and this is the first time uh, I've heard this kind of ambiguity in trying to decide what an area represents. And I'm afraid I just can't join the ambiguity. I, I'm going to have to say this is a pond. It doesn't merit applying riverfront definition. Any other members want to comment on that? I mean, I know where Carrie and Lisa fall and Dan mentioned his, but I, I just, I mean, to me, there's so many well-defined features of how to make a decision in the Wetland Protection Act, and I just can't consider this that ambiguous. I'm with Lisa and Carrie. Likewise. Well, um, Scott, can you review the historic burials and see what I'm talking about? Uh, yeah, and, and I can, I will, and I have, uh, you know, to to a degree, um, looked at what you're talking about. And I understand I'm for USGS maps that tells the story to me. Well, uh, uh, and I understand that, and I suspect. Some of those maps also predate the creation of that um, spillway that currently exists, or the weir that we have. Yeah, I couldn't. I didn't know when that was constructed. Oh, does anybody know that? Tim, do we have dates on that of approximate construction? Certainly pre 1960. I don't have the exact date off the top of my head. Oh, I'm wondering if it was done in conjunction with 140. It seems as though it would have to be, right? Because those old, old yeah. ones you feel didn't have 140 on there. Right. So, and just, the, just to let everybody know, the date postmark on the dam itself is 1966. Okay. And when was 140 constructed? 65? In the, in, the four, in the 40s, I believe. Oh, in the 40s. Oh, then, they did, then they did improvements back in the 60s, I believe. Okay. So, you know, it's very hard to make determinations on current field conditions based on pre-1960, pre-World War II kind of, kind of um, layouts on most GS maps. We all know uh, many, many rivers have been rerouted, you know, pipes, uh, dams, all kinds of stuff has happened. The, the inception of the Wetland Protection Act almost becomes our ground zero for, for a lot of these a lot of these matters. Uh, you know, that big court case you guys were involved in recently kind of validated that the significance of, of um, the, the beginning of the Wetland Protection Act pre versus post. So in our case here, if, if, if that weir structure predates the Wetland Protection Act, then the status of the pond at that picture moment in time is, is, is what we're looking at. And just because there's remnants of a channel that exist under there, um, you know, to me, with short of having many directional flow being strongly evident in that pond, which it's not, um, the normal high water condition may have a channel and the portions of it. That happens all the time. You see it when you know beavers dam up ponds, all kinds of things. We have remnants channels that can last many, many decades. That, 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 just just because you have a pond now doesn't mean that automatically when something underneath that pond um, fills up with sediment. The sedimentation process can take a very long time to fill in remnant, remnant stream channels. So um, 
Let me ask you this. Why, what's from, I think DEP needs to make this decision in the end. I have my opinion, I have my professional opinion. So can you just file an ANRAD and let DEP well, uh, weigh in on this, which. And I appreciate that sentiment. And I guess in hindsight now, looking back, I, I wish we had, you know, gone the ANRAD route first to keep the, the issues segmented. Um, so that we could just focus on the resources rather than the project. Yeah. But if the if the sentiment of the commission majority is what was spoken a few minutes ago and, and unwavering, then I would like the opportunity to prior to just shooting this up to DEP, see if I can review the proposed project with a you know hypothetical riverfront line to the point where we just discussed. If the numbers all work and the performance standards can be satisfied, then you know maybe that's a way forward. Okay. If it seems like it's a kind of a deal breaker for this project, yeah. then you know I may have to consent to your uh, recommended approach that we we get denied and go to go to the department. But I'd like that opportunity first to see if we can pull yeah. it off. Certainly, I mean I would welcome your opinion at this point. Well, I mean I meant try um, to get the project to demonstrate regular oh. compliance with a partial riverfront yeah. area yeah. Uh, on, on the site and see how, yeah. see if that lays out okay or mm -hmm. not. And I would, I would probably extrapolate the channel as it lies underneath the, the pond and then show 200 feet from that, rather than go 200 feet from the edge of the pond, 200 feet from the, the channel, the visible channel on the drawdown condition. Use that as our riverfront area. Stop it at the delta where you identify on the map. Draw 200 feet. See where that puts us for our impact areas, and then we we'll bring it back for you for discussion. Well, what, Scott, why wouldn't you use mini annual? Because right now you're telling me you're going to take it off the thread of it, then then you know you're kind of self-serving, self-fulfilling prophecy there. Because you're not going to be in the riverfront. Well, right? it. it so, so mean, mean annual is the flooding of the river. Mean annual is not, um, so we have water, uh, rivers that flow through like flooded, flooded swamps and things like that. You still have to find the channel even within the flooded swamps. You know, if you think back to those days of yeah. when Heidi Davis, you know, was touting the origin of the Rivers Protection Act and we're out there in chest waders saying, here's the river's edge. You know, you have to find where the river feature is when you have flood waters that disrupt it. And in this case, we're saying, okay, this flood water that disrupt it. Otherwise, I just go, I, I just go, might as well take on all the boards and say, okay, now here's where the river is, not just where it's uh, artificially flooded to. You right. I'd re I'd refrain from taking out the boards. We have a project down gradient of the river that. Well, I, uh, I, I mean, know. I'm sort of speaking in in, 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 in just sort of. Uh, linguistics here, but you know, okay. the point being is the only reason it's flooded beyond the banks is because of the presence of the boards. Right. And I think, I yes, think Scott, to, to tailor back to your, your context there with how you're going to establish the riverfront area, I think that's a, a good safe approach to kind of figure out what the center line of the historic stream, stream channel is, and then extrapolate a 200 foot riverfront area off of that. To and project it onto your proposed project and see how much that impacts your project. I think I've done that in the past as well, and mm -hmm. it seemed to work uh, for you know kind of figuring out if this was going to affect the project. So I think that's a a valid um, and safe approach for this project. Okay. I appreciate that feedback, John. Okay. So we'll request a continue unless there's further discussion on this. I'd like to just interject and. Um, request a continuation to the next meeting to have this discussed further. All right. So, uh, if, and I guess unless there are other specific comments or questions, we can consider that as a motion. Uh, the date of our next meeting is January 10th. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll make a motion to continue. Uh, Excuse me. File two five zero dash one zero seven zero to uh, the uh, yeah. did I get that right? The January tenth meeting. All right. All right. 
Second. Uh, we have a, a motion made by Dan Pearson, seconded by uh, Ron. Uh, so we can do a roll call vote beginning with Ron and Lisa. Aye. Aye. And Dan Doyle and Dan Pearson. Aye. Uh, Dan Doyle, did you get a, a vote in there? Oh, yeah, so was an aye. Okay. And uh, Carrie? Aye. And I'll throw in an aye. So uh, we'll see you guys again on the 10th. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Uh, our next um, hearing is a continuation of an ANRAD for Zero Pine Street, uh, D file, DP file number 250-10A4. Um, so this, this is, um, it appears all of the necessary information has been submitted. Uh, do we have a representative or, or is this something we are just going to close and act on? I think we're good to, to Claire. Representing, if you want to ask any questions or want me to go over anything, that's fine. Um, whatever you prefer. Well, I think everybody is happy uh, with the information that has been submitted. Uh, I guess there was a peer review um, that went over everything, and that was in on the 5th of December, and plans were revised, received on the 8th. So, uh, John, uh, from your perspective, uh, we can close, and then it looks like we already have of the special conditions for the ANRAC. That's correct, Julian. Um, We're all set. I have a question. Um, okay, can ahead. you just confirm um, isolated vegetated wetland? Can you just confirm which flag series that is? Uh, sure. Well, that was um, a B series um, flagging series. However, during the peer review process, um, the peer reviewer evaluated that area and determined that it did not in fact meet the standards for federal um, jurisdiction um, based on the lack of um, hydric indicators and the soil profile not meeting any hydric indicators. So at his suggestion, we removed that entirely from the plans because it was non-jurisdictional on local, state, and federal level. Okay, I think what threw me is John Thomas, you you included it in the ORAD as number six. So we we can talk about it later, but is that coming out now? Because there is no IBW. Uh, that's probably an error on my part. Okay, okay, just checking because I couldn't find that series on the plans. Okay, I got it. Uh, detail. Yeah. Okay, I got it. Thank you. All right, I guess unless there are further questions, we can consider a motion to close the public hearing file number 250-1084, uh, ANRAD for Zero Pine Street. I'll make that motion close the public hearing. Motion made by Lisa and seconded by? I'll second that. Uh, looks like Dan Doyle seconded that. So <laughs> again, roll call vote starting with Ron and Lisa. Aye. Aye. Dan Doyle and Dan Pearson. Aye. Aye. And, um, oh, Carrie, there you are. Aye. And I'll throw in an aye. So we, I think we have, uh, we'll, we'll be going over the, the uh, special uh, conditions for the ANRAD uh, subsequently. Uh, and now um, our next Item is file number 250-1082, Zero Leonard Street. Uh, uh, Jeffrey O'Neill uh, has been through multiple hearings, predominantly uh, for completion of the stormwater review. Um, and I believe everything has been submitted. Are there any questions or comments um, from members of the commission or the representatives. Um, just for the record, I have to um, confuse. Oh, yes. 
So uh, for the record, Lisa recuses and, um, but all of the information is listed as submitting, submitted. So uh, John, unless there are further questions or questions from members of the commission, we can consider a motion to close and then we would later be deliberating on the uh, submitted draft of order conditions. So everything's in good standing. I guess the only uh, kind of outlying information that we need to discuss is the um, the posts, the visual barrier posts, whether the commission feels that similar to phase one, the posts themselves are sufficient for kind of having that, or if they want to, uh, I guess, make it more in line with the split rail fence, I guess, you know, since they already did the phase one with posts uh, for the visual barrier, if the, those would be uh, sufficient. Now, this uh, project is going to have um, an operations and maintenance plan. So that should be, and it obviously is going to be done by a contractor. So I'm assuming my, from my perspective, the posts will be adequately, uh, will be adequate to prevent um, any kind of intrusion into the, the wetland areas. So uh, other commission members have opinions about that? I feel like the posts and signs would be fine. All right, so unless there are further questions or comments, I think we can consider a motion for uh, closing the public hearing for file number 250-1082. I'll make a motion to close public hearing number 250-1082. I'll second that. Motion made by Ron and seconded by Dan Doyle. So again, roll call vote beginning with uh, Ron and Lisa. Oh, Lisa aye. has to abstain. So we have a, an aye from Ron and now Dan Doyle and Dan Pierce. Aye. Aye. And Kerry? Aye. And I'll throw in an aye. So the motion carries. The hearing is closed. So we actually are coming down to um, deliberation time. The only item uh, next is a request for a partial certificate of compliance uh, for file number 250-1018. Uh, so that, uh, well, John, why don't you just comment on that particular item? Sure. So, um, Mr. Uh, Fernandes, who's actually on the call with us, uh, requested a, a, a certificate of compliance, full certificate of compliance for uh, the house lot off of uh, South Worcester Street, uh, 465 to be exact. And I went out there with, uh, with Megan and we took a look at the site. And uh, it looks like the whole entire site's been stabilized. The construction or visible barrier posts were installed. Uh, the work appears to be um, within the parameters of the um, what was proposed. There's some minor modifications, but those are nothing major to report. Um, but besides that, I think it, it uh, deserves a full uh, sign off from the commission for co compliance with the proposed work. Um, John, right. is there a reason why the wetland flag numbers aren't on this plan? Which one? The one we're about to vote oh, on. Sorry. The request. It should be on there. It just says edge of BDW. Let me just double check. Okay. I, I was just surprised that they didn't just carry over the flag numbers. Yeah, those those should have been on there. The one that I had had flag numbers on it. Um, Steve, 10 point, the one I have is 10.26.1. Oh, no. Yeah, this, this doesn't have the flag numbers on it. The one that I had for the proposed work had the flag numbers on it. Right. I would think okay. we want to add the flag yeah, those, numbers. Those should be added to the, to the plan. Yeah. So I think that that could be a minor add. Yep. Yeah. Is that something you can get to us if, um. Yeah. You have no issue. Okay. So are we going to continue to uh, consider a vote on this with uh, 
Uh, John, just ensuring that the flag numbers are there. Uh, I think that that would be sufficient. I can definitely make sure that the plan accurately shows the flag numbers as they were um, previously delineated. Yeah, I mean, you can probably get it to, if you can get it to John in the next day or two, then then by the time he writes it out, you know, just don't issue it, John, so we get it, right? Okay, so I would make the motion. <laughs> I make the motion to issue the poll. Oh, you're looking for a poll? Yeah. Okay, uh, full certificate compliance for 250 1018. I'll motion, second. Motion made by Lisa, seconded by uh, Dan Doyle. A roll call vote beginning with Ron and Lisa. Aye. Aye. And then Dan Doyle and Dan Pearson. Aye. Aye. And for the record, that was Dan Pearson that seconded that. Yeah. Oh, it was? Okay. Well, uh, we'll just need to correct that, uh, John. And uh, then Carrie? Aye. And I'll throw in an aye. So the motion carries. Um, next item is, uh, so Thanks. we're now going to orders of conditions. Um, So file number 258, because they have a big pile here. Um, they gave us a lot of homework there, John Thomas. I don't know. Uh, yeah. I, uh, we don't have to. We don't have to issue it all now. We just closed them all. We can just issue this one if you want. Uh, no, we we, we uh, you you're just pushing our headaches forward. Uh, exactly. That's not what I want to do. Um. All right, so. So 1088, John, uh, JLM Martins. Yeah, that's right. who's on the application yeah. as a landowner. One of my questions is, uh, do we fill in number four? Four for, hold so on. So condition yeah, four on. has some blanks in it. Is that what we're deciding tonight? You have to guide us, we're getting tired. <laughs> I'm sorry, I've got a lot of stuff on my computer right now. Condition four. Yes, condition four. Okay. It references a blank blank fence. Fill in the blank. Oh yeah, that's yeah. the that's the that's the one question is I didn't know what kind of oh. fence. So I'd have to. I was hoping the applicant was going to be here. Well, did they? Well, why are we saying it won't be a split rail? Did they say they didn't want a split rail? Well, because they're putting up a fence bar barricade there. They're gonna. It's basically gonna be a, a wood um, slat fence, and I, I thought it would just match whatever height it was going to be. I just wanted them to confirm that. I can confirm that with them. Okay. Um, number five. Mm -hmm. We're talking about an invasive species management plan. Yep. So. We tell them they have to do it. We're not telling them when or where or to who they have to submit it and how often. And do we really have to do any follow up? Um, are we going to ask for it every year, every two years? So I think we need to embellish that condition a bit. So do we expect it? You know, I think it needs to be more direct to say the applicant shall provide. An invasive species management plan, you know, on a yearly basis, whatever it is, right, for review and approval. Yeah. And and then when, what about condition six? So, but we're not asking them for a report. So they're just going to tell you, hey, we're all set and you're going to go inspect it, or we're not looking for a deliverable. That's my question, I guess. Are we not looking for a deliverable? So the onus is going to be on you to go out to make sure after two years, it's good. We're not going to ask that. Typically, you ask the applicant to hire somebody to go and do a report, right? And then you go check it out. Do we right. My, my, my guess is that, for instance, when they issue the certificate of compliance or ask a request for a certificate of compliance, I'm going to ensure that that area is taken care of. And if it's not, then, for instance, I'm going to tell them that they should probably, um, you know, fix it um, prior to getting a certificate of compliance for the work. Well, uh, you know, we, we uh, learned that lesson a long time ago, John, about asking, waiting to tie things to a certificate of compliance, as you know. So I don't think that's a great idea. <laughs> okay. Uh, 
So I'm, I'm open. I'm open to. I'm I'm open to uh, deliberation on how to pursue this one then. Well, I think they're going to owe us something, right? After the first growing season, after the second growing season, they owe us a deliverable, right? So I think that I don't think we should tie it to the CLC though. So I, do you want to see it after the first year or the second year? That's the question. I mean, I'm comfortable with the second year. Okay. Then I think we need to be direct and say the applicant shall provide the uh, status of the, however you want to word this thing, invasive species management plan to the agent for review and approval. Okay. Okay. Um, then in the meeting minutes, it said that we were going to request, and this may be in here, I may have glazed over. We were going to request the name and contact of the licensed um, applicator. Yes. Is that in here? That is under the commencement activities for the project site. Oh, under what, what number is it? Sorry. I have, um, uh, let's see. Well, I have a final invasive species, species management report will be submitted to the commission. And then I also have uh, also um, submit a letter from a licensed pesticide herbicide applicator describing compliance with invasive species management plan and explain any deviations from the approved plan. So which condition is that? So that's this is all in 13. This is prior to commencement of activities on site. Oh, and then okay. For, then for 14, I have them upon completion of all proposed improved work. Okay. So we're not going to approve their select their vendor? beforehand we just want to know after the fact or because typically i think we approve the vendor we say yes that's that's good that's a licensed vendor so I, i'll change that to the name okay okay but but if they're licensed applicators do we really influence that no but we just make sure that they're hiring somebody that is licensed that's all we're looking for. We're looking to make sure that person is licensed so they don't do Joe Blow. Right? That's what we're looking for. That's what we've already looked for. So they just send us a one page and telling us who's going to do it with person's licensing information. That's all I had. Okay. Any other uh, comments about the remainder of the of the um, draft order? Uh, uh, the bulk of this is is pretty much boilerplate. It appears. So if well, not for the comments, I think we can. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Yeah. So making I'm a motion. I'll make a motion to um, issue the, the heck is it the order of conditions for file two fifty ten eighty eight as discussed. Motion made by Lisa and seconded by. Second. Seconded by Carrie. Um, so again, roll call vote beginning with Ron and Lisa. Aye. Aye. And Dan Doyle and Dan Pearson. Aye. Aye. And, and Carrie? Aye. And I'll throw in an aye, so the motion carries. Um, so, so I assume we're going to be jumping back to our first item on the agenda, which is the um, request for determination. And um, so this is a negative determination, I am presuming, because uh, it's a straightforward project, very discreet, and can be done, assuming it's done according to plan. So unless there's further discussion, we can consider a motion for um, the project on 4 Lagoon Lane. Did you give us anything on that, John? Yeah, it, it's actually was submitted with the plan, and then there was a form 
for the um, request for determination of applicability. I don't have any special conditions for the RDA. Yeah, the, the form was was filled out as a, it's, let's see, negative. Well, it, actually, there's not a check mark under three, but um, on the form. So we're not issuing anything. It's just a negative determination. It's just a form. It's really yeah, a negative, negative three. Yeah. Okay. Oh, so sorry. We're making the motion then to issue a negative three. Right. Correct. Okay. So I will make that motion. I think you just did. So motion made by Lisa. <laughs> okay. Second by. I'll second that. Uh, by Dan Doyle. Uh, roll call vote starting with Ron and Lisa. Aye. Aye. And then uh, Dan Doyle, Dan Pearson. Aye. Aye. And Carrie. Aye. And I'll throw in an aye. Uh, our next item is order of conditions uh, for lot three, John Scott Boulevard, file number 250-1089. Uh, this is the single family house with um, very limited um, buffer zone work and then uh it was in the the outer riparian way uh, riparian zone is that correct yeah a good portion of the house is in within the riparian zone so i didn't i did not find anything controversial in here i don't know if anyone else has any uh, comments questions so the only thing that was going to change is lisa's recommendation for the um for the construction uh, entrance, yeah, yes, sediment tracking. So I'm going to add that into this. And then, John, just uh, just to put the actual percentage, it just cracks me up. Just put the actual percentage of riverfront, which I asked him to put on the plan. You know, right? No, don't, don't tell me it's less than. Give me a number <laughs> so we can go right to it. Um, and then the only other thing I'd ask you to do is there's no address on this, um, so I think you can set a lot three or a. In, along with that to say number 133 so it matches okay. the plans yep okay 133 yep all right um so unless there are any further modifications of the craft we can consider a motion so we're going to issue pending receipt of an of, of, um, update plan. Yes. Okay. So then I would make that motion. I, I, a question: uh, updated plan. So this is, oh, this is the, the the note that uh, the. This is the, the one where they have to adjust the silt fence, change the silt sock, oh, add the address. Yeah. All minor all minor changes that can be addressed okay. by the yeah. office as needed. Yeah. Okay. So John, just uh, one second. Yeah. Okay. All right. So motion made by Lisa, uh, seconded by Carrie. Uh, again, a roll call vote, uh, starting with Ron and Lisa. Aye. Aye. And then Dan Doyle, Dan Pearson. Aye. And Carrie. Aye. And I'll throw in an aye. Motion carries. Um. So the next one I have on my pile is file number 250-1090 um, concerning the uh, ORAD at 1 Power Street. That was kind of the add-on from the uh, ORAD of the lots out front. Uh, there's just a single couple of, well, there are three items, but um, uh, straightforward uh, ORAD. So, John, can you just confirm that the ORAD is correct with the map and parcel and not the agenda, right? It was. Yeah, the agenda, 20, the agenda, the agenda had the wrong information. Okay. Yep. So it's this that 22 parcel too. This is correct. Yes. Okay. Thank you. 
Use the heck out of it. All right, um, I'm there though. So I, I would make a motion to issue the um, the ORAD for 250-1090. Motion made by Lisa, seconded by? I'll second that. By Dan Doyle. A roll call vote beginning with Ron and Lisa. Aye. Aye. And Dan Doyle and Dan Pearson. Aye. Aye. And Carrie. Aye. And I'll throw in an aye. That motion carries. Uh, next item is uh, Zero Pine Street, Order of Resource Area Delineation, file number 250-1084. Uh, this has uh, as a bigger, bigger area. So I didn't find anything unusual here. Anybody else have any comments, questions? The only question was uh, with Lisa's question regarding the wetland flag B, B flag series. So we'll we'll take care of that. The muted Lisa, sorry. The mouse. Okay, <laughs> my mouse is hidden. Sorry. Um, okay, striking number six, and then adding tonight's hearing under number eight. Right. Okay. All right. Um, are we ready for a motion? Uh, I'll make that motion to issue uh, the full red for 250-1084. Motion made by Lisa, seconded by? Second. By Carrie. Um, roll call vote beginning with Ron and Lisa. Aye. Aye. And then Dan Doyle and Dan Pierce. Aye. Aye. And Lisa, uh, Carrie. Aye. And I'll throw in an aye. And now we have somewhat more substantial order of conditions for file number 250 1082, uh, 0 Leonard Street. Blue Star Business Park Phase Two. Um, and, and selfishly, John Thomas, can I wave goodbye? Yes, you can. <laughs> there you Thank go. You. Good night. Good night. Happy holidays, Lisa. Thank you. You too. Good night. Good night. Uh, happy holidays. Bye. So, John, this is a rather. Um, comprehensive set of conditions. Yes. And I'm going to have to say, I, I mean, yeah, a lot of the standard stuff is in here, but you have, you refer to much of the information base. I'm going to assume that's correct. Right. And in, in hindsight, prior to this meeting, I actually had Condine and the pre engineering take a review of the order as well to see yeah. if they had any concerns. And we worked out some kinks with the project and this is kind of what we came up with in agreement for uh, kind of what it should be laid out for, uh, for this. So if the commission has any other questions or comments, the only major thing was the post versus the split rail. That was one of the concerns that they had. So if the commission feels that there's any other concerns or comments that they have pertaining to the order conditions as currently drafted up, Feel free to comment now. Well, I mean, we already reviewed the post, uh, but uh, my my sense is that um, this is not quite the same as a uh, a layperson landowner because these these projects are managed managed by professional management companies, and they generally are aware of the. Um, requirements for the Wetland Protection Act. So I'm comfortable with the, the posts and I did not find anything in my rather brief review of these that I would change. But any other comments from members of the commission? Any other 
And if not, we can consider um, a motion to issue orders of conditions for file number 250-1082. I'll make the motion to order the, um, uh, make, approve the order of conditions for 250-1082. All right, motion made by Dan Doyle. Second. And, and seconded by uh, Ron, uh, where this is issuing order of conditions uh, as uh, slightly modified with regard to the uh, the marker post. So roll call vote beginning with Ron and Dan Doyle. Aye. Aye. And Dan Pearson and Kerry. Aye. aye. And I'll throw in an aye. So um, enjoy your holidays, guys. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so we still have we still have um, meeting minutes for no uh, Monday, November twenty second. I have to say, uh, I mean, this is almost a word for word transcription. Is that correct, John? Is that is that what it is? Well, it almost looks like that. I mean, we're passing from one member to the other. Uh, no, uh, no real editorialization. I, I, I don't know. Um, it, it was this put together by Megan or? This was put together by Megan. Do you guys want it more um, well, I, brief I, or? You know, I, I have no preference myself. It's just, in, and, and the question is whether it is the output of a uh, a word interpreting program because I and to me that's fine. I, I was I was on a Zoom call recently in which there was a trans a real time transcript being produced and it was amazingly uh, had very high fidelity. So um, and you know if somebody really wants the public record they can they can read it. That's fine with me. One Any thing, other? Yeah, go ahead. One thing I might suggest for Megan is that you uh, just enter for your own sake the uh, the spelling of Winnicott. Just add it to the um, things like that to the spell checker. That way you won't see as much red on the. But that's you know that's your your. Um, there's a sentence on page four at the bottom page four, uh, with the impound in place for Meadowbrook and with lack of primarily rivering characteristics, not just any characteristics that could be considered as such, but primarily seeing as they have the paucity of those features. Um, and I would just put uh, for features just to make the sentence a little clearer, comma, in this instance, Brook Pond, comma, as it has previously been, should continue to be considered a pawn. Um, well, I'd still. Uh, uh, yeah, but let's let's ask me because if this is in fact a transcript of the spoken, you know what actually was spoken. Oh, well, people don't. Right. Well, people don't speak in. Uh, Pause. Well, they, I mean. Exact transcript of speech is often very grammatically incorrect. It is. It is a transcription, just so everybody is aware. Yeah. We tried. We tried something new. Well, I, and, and well I, to me, to me, that's fine because it's a recording of the actual communication that went back and forth. So I don't think we, if if that's what we're going to adopt, I don't think we should modify it. It's it's what people said, and um, and that's fine. I I agree with you Julian I, I I agree that we shouldn't modify it but what people says often has punctuation but but that's yeah I mean that's implied with the, with the pauses and so on um, anyway I agree with you we shouldn't we shouldn't change it uh, one more small thing I, you might consider is uh, I was uh, in the latter pages, uh, and this is very similar, uh, 
when you have Winnicunit Pond or Norton Reservoir, reservoir and pond are not capitalized. And so, again, you. I, I'm just pointing it out. I don't, no, wait, wait, wait. It's say, not going to keep like that. I didn't, I didn't get that. Uh, at least towards the beginning of the, the end of the document, which is where I start to notice it. Yeah. Uh, you will have instances where it says, for example, Norton Reservoir or some or Winnicunit Pond and the Winnicunit or Norton will capitalize. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pond or reservoir will not. And I'm just right. pointing it out. It's not going to keep me up at night. Yes. I'm just saying it's something you could use the replace the replace function and just go through or or not. I'm yeah, it, it's going to be difficult because we we've got to try to allow the office staff to be efficient. Medical chaos. I know. I know. I'm just kidding. I'm, I'm kidding. So when I got the uh, transcript, uh, I did go back and try to redo it and make sure that it made sense because sometimes when it's coming off, it, you know, translate different. Um, but I did go through and try to fix it as best I could before presenting it. it you know, it looks great, Megan. It really. looks great. I mean, these it, are just things that I'm just, you know, just, uh, yeah, it's it, like, Julie, uh, Julian would most likely not leave out a stitch at the end of uh, some form of operation. And uh, well, and you're bringing up a key point here that people will be looking at that work potentially for the rest of that person's life. But <laughs> let's ask how many people are going to read this cover to cover. Well, this is some, it's this riveting, is Julian. Time. I don't this understand. This is some riveting literature, <laughs> Julian. The, the, amount, the amount of time the drama. I spend stitching, no. and I've been proud you know, of some faces I've sewn up. But nothing, nothing that's in the movies today compete with the banana peel test. Uh, and if it's it's a tea that Lisa isn't here now, because I was going to ask her, if we throw in a coconut in <laughs> Uh, what will happen to that? <laughs> All right. Well, I, I'm happy with this transcript, and I can entertain a motion to approve the minutes of November 22nd. So uh, moved. Okay. Uh, somebody made a second. Was that you, Carrie? Yep. That's all right. So mm -hmm. uh, uh, motion by Ron to approve, seconded by Carrie. Uh, we're going to do a roll call vote. Ron and Dan Doyle. Aye. Aye. And um, Dan Peterson and Carrie. Aye. aye. And I'll be an aye. And I think that comes to uh, the end of our agenda unless we have something else. So uh, I'll make a motion to adjourn. Uh, oh. Well, hang on to have a second. Uh, it, so we've kind of put out the word for our replacement uh, uh, member. The board is out. We've um, had, we have a potential candidate as of right now, just waiting to hear back to see if they are willing to uh, join our team. And, okay. Uh, just waiting to hear back. Hopefully get word back in the next week or two, maybe after the holiday. I'm not sure. Uh, and I, I assume think Gene could, is okay. It, it, Gene has additional stresses, and he decided to step away from this form of stress okay. for a time. And uh, we will wish him and his wife the best of luck. So one of the uh, items that's on, I guess, the docket is uh, the, a new bill signing uh, for the commission. I believe Carrie is currently one where you need another one. Um, so I don't know who would like to volunteer their time and services to come by, by and sign stuff for us. I'm, I'm happy to do it. I'm, I'm close by if it take me to. All right, Dan. Sounds good. You're it. Super. <laughs> um, All right. Thank you for... Uh, I'll, I'll I'll leave that hanging. <laughs> well, uh, John, John, how 
uh, or Megan, uh, how will you contact me regarding bill signing? How will I know? If, if you have a preference, I normally email um, and I just say, you know, within the next few days, um, because you were just, you know, uh, appointed for it, uh, you do have to come in and sign a piece of paper so that the accounting office will know what your signature is and know what, um, you know, that you, you're an okay bill signer. Um, and I do already have a couple bills waiting to be signed as well. Okay. Yeah. All right. But if you come in anytime, Megan. Thank you. And and Megan, just a, a note. Uh, if you need me to come in and sign stuff, as as I will be having to do, please text me instead of email. There are times when I don't get to my email for three or four days, so texting will give me a heads up quickly. Okay, perfect. I'll do that. And just so uh, everyone's aware, aware we have a um, bookshelf cubby for everybody with their names on it uh, near the conservation Ooh, office. So everybody gets their own little cubby uh, for paperwork and sign stuff to, you know, when we actually start meeting in person again. Is that on the left just before we, I turn to to uh, Megan's desk? Yeah, it's going to be on your right facing the, the wetland wall that we oh, okay. constructed. Okay. Next to the printer, the large scale printer. All right, change is good. So uh, we're going to be officially adjourned by raising our hands. Yes. Uh, good night. Till next time on the tenth, or maybe. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Happy, holidays. Happy New Year. Be safe, everybody. Take care.